Hi, I'm Sampo Kellomäki, the lead architect of the TAS3 Trusted Architecture for Securely Shareable Services with Privacy and also the CTO of Synergetics. Uh, I'm here to tell about why we created TAS3. Effectively, we started from an observation that a lot of the technology for privacy-friendly stuff and for security, digital signals, so all that kind of existed, but nobody really had put it all together. And we were feeling that the way the internet is developing, there's lots of pain points for the normal end users. Users feel that they are not in control, their data is kind of scattered all around. And what we really wanted to do is use these technologies that already exist to give the data back to the user, give the user control and make the user feel safe so that he can, he can trust the players in the network, trust the service providers to behave properly. And once they do trust, they are more willing to use the systems and effectively open new markets, new applications, uh, which weren't really acceptable to the users prior to this system. Now I'm going to go a little bit more detailed into the architecture. If you are really interested, you can also access all of this material on the task3.eu website, where all these deliverables are available. Um, and also the reference implementation is available from the zxid.org website. Okay, so now if you look at this picture, we can see here the user at the top is the king, of course. So our architecture is very user-centric. And what we mean by this is that the user is always in control. We have uh, first websites that the user might access. The website access is facilitated through single sign-on based on an identity provider. Now, once the user does access the website, there are several authorization points. So all these red boxes are the authorization points, essentially enforcement points where we have a separate picture where we have then the entire detail of what goes in there. In any case, the user then when he accesses a website generates audit trail events that go, go to an audit bus, which conveys some summary data about these events to a user audit dashboard, where the user can later see what, uh, how his data has been accessed, can also see that, oh, this was the access that myself, I actually authorized, I visited the website, therefore it's logical and natural that I did access. Some of the accesses, however, will be based on a web services calls. So the website will call other service providers, and this is, of course, something where user is not interacting himself. Instead, he's just by triggering a business process, effectively causing these other things to happen as well. And in present, you know, competing systems, there's no visibility for user to understand that this happened. Whereas in the task three system, because the audit trail data flows to the user audit dashboard, the user can see perfectly well that it happened. Another important feature of the task three architecture is that we enable a competitive marketplace of services. So the idea is that the user can choose from several providers of a similar service. So let's say in our example of employability, user could choose out of many possible uh, placement providers or matching providers. And this is facilitated by personal service discovery component of the TAS3 architecture. Uh, effectively, the services are registered here and when the user is about to call it, user might be presented with a screen where user can choose out of the possible providers of this service. All of this is now enclosed in this big blue box, that's the trust network. So there's a trust network that has an oversight role and essentially is checking that everybody plays by the rules. Of course, the audit records that go to the audit bus are also accessible to this uh, governance part. And then they can also run a robot called uh, online compliance testing. It's kind of like a spider that goes and calls all of these services as if it was a user, effectively making sure that the service providers are playing by the rules. The service provider typically cannot know that it is the robot calling them rather than a real user. Uh, this allows the trust network um, governor effectively to detect bad behavior before the users themselves detect. It's also, let's say, in a less malicious way, it simply detects also bugs. So sometimes, you know, there might be software upgrade there, there was no malicious intent, but something broke. This happens a lot in IT. This way, we actually detect it rather quickly in an automatic way and are able to heal the network before most of the users even see the problem. Another mod module we also have at the governance level is the trust scoring. So out of all the audit data, we can essentially see how, and also the testing data, we can see how the service providers behave and we can effectively change their trust scoring. So if we see that some service provider has some problems, 
we can reduce the trust scoring. If we get complaints from the users about the service provider, we can also reduce the trust scoring. And this trust scoring in the discovery step, when the user chooses which provider to use, the trust scoring is one of the things we provide for the user to make an educated choice. So here is now the block diagram of TAS3. So in the block diagram, first of all, we have the user again in the top. And uh, there might be some browser side technology, you know, Ajax and that type of stuff. But the most of the action happens in the front channel. So essentially user accessible websites. And then in back channel, you know, the kind of a, the web service calls that uh, respect the task free methodology. So we have the front end web GUI. We have probably a business process engine of some sort. It might use some business process modeling language or it might be ad hoc. And then we have the web services. We also have here a user audit dashboard. This was the place where the user can see the audit records. And then we have the policy editor and the consent management. This is the place where the user can deny future accesses or maybe even go up front even before any access already deny certain types of accesses. Uh, and another important feature of Task3 is delegation. So user is able to delegate access to his resources to some other person. It could be that your mother delegates to you so that you can help her, or maybe you organize so that your children's rights are delegated to you as a parent so that you, you can take care of things. Or it could be a professional context where it affects it's a power of attorney type thing. In any case, so the delegation has settings part and then it has the runtime part. So effectively, when the web services calls are happening in the back channel, the delegation uh, service issues digital sign tokens that testify whether this delegation really exists. And so this is not, you know, ad hoc delegation. This is actually audit trail verifiable delegation. It will stand in court of law if you demonstrate the token or if you fail to demonstrate any token, it will be possible to prove that you did not have the delegation right. Um, another interesting part, okay, so we have the identity provider that takes care of authentication. Uh, but the other interesting thing that the identity provider does is to organize the pseudonymous uh, plumbing to work. So the identifier, which is different from identity, the identifier used to identify you at different services is different at each service. And this is a very important privacy feature because it prevents correlation without your consent. So although you use many different websites during your session, your difficult day, these websites cannot know that it was the same you at each one of them. They can know when you come back to the website that it's the same you, but they cannot compare notes with the other websites. And this is not actually something very easy to do. This is something that uh, a lot of the other technologies that don't manage to do, or they do it very superficially. But instead, we are able to do it very deeply, going very deep into the uh, web services call chains. So every step of the way, we are able to keep it around. And the identity mapper is one of the components very important in that. The discovery service I already discussed a little bit. The credentials and policies negotiator is a component that allows the user to make an automated decision about which service to use based on what policies a given uh, website or web service is uh, willing to obey. For example, if the user wants to employ um, intended use policy and he's then as part of the business process about his data is about to be passed to a website a web service that actually doesn't promise to honor that type of a policy, we can stop the process before the data is given out. On the other hand, we can also propose to this uh, web service that, well, you will only get the data if you promise to follow this policy, in which case the web service can make a decision whether they want to have a customer and honor it, or maybe they want to stick to their policies and not to have a customer. Uh, okay, the audit bus we already discussed, but essentially from all of these parts, the audit events come. Another thing that uh, is visible here is essentially auditing and monitoring function. Now this auditing and monitoring function exists at two levels, well actually three. So there was the user audit, then there is every organization auditing themselves. So effectively an organization has active interest to have uh, the evidence to show that they have obeyed the law. So in case they are challenged, they can show that they played by the rules. And then of course the audit has to happen also by the a trust network governance structure to check that uh, people are playing by the rules. Okay, we have the online compliance testing robot, and then we have operational monitoring. This is like more traditional stuff like intrusion detection, fraud detection, those types of things that, you know, they are not particularly new to TAS3, but they obviously integrate into the TAS3 architecture as well. Uh, finally, we have the modeling domain. In modeling domain, we essentially have the business processes and the 
intended uses and all the policies modeled, which has the advantage that they can be propagated into all the different enforcement points. So we can effectively generate automatically the configuration of the enforcement points from this model, and therefore it's consistent. Uh, we also have the ontologies available here. Effectively, one of the reasons why we need ontology is that there's many types of credentials in the world. And in order to have interoperability between systems, just at the authorization and security level, we already need to do credential mapping, and we need the ontology for this. Of course, ontologies can also be used at the application layer. There's lots of use for them there. OK, so this is the four-point authorization framework of TAS3. So the points are being here one, two, three, four. Now this is much more than a traditional. In a traditional world you have, let's say, somebody tries to make a web service call on the front door, you either accept it or you don't accept it and that's it. But that's actually oversimplified. It doesn't address really what is needed in real life. What we do here, first of all, at the requester outbound gate, if the user is about to send data out, it is already at that stage that we have to make a decision, is it possible to send this data out. For example, if we know that the service provider is unwilling to honor the intended use policy, we have to stop the data from being sent in the first place, and that happens here. On the other hand, if we do decide to change the data, we can attach to it policies. Let's say we attach to it a data retention policy. Now at the point two, the one that is about to receive the data has to make a decision are they willing to honor this policy? If they are unwilling to honor the policy, they should really reject the data, otherwise they might be liable. Um, okay, this is usually, by the way, what is the traditional front door author authorization. Anyway, so then we query the data from the, or we might insert the data, or let's now change that, imagine this was actually a query. So we query the data from the database. Only once we know what the data is, we can know what are the sticky policies attached to it. And like this intended use is one of typical sticky policies. So a lot of the traditional systems are not able to cope with the idea that different items of data might have different policy. But we are, because at this uh, enforcement point three, once we already know what the data is, we are able to make a decision based on those policies. And then finally, there's enforcement point four, the data is sent back with the policies attached again. If the requester is unwilling to honor the policies, it should discard the data already right here. Or if it's willing to honor the policies, it still has to make a note, because some of the policies cannot be complied with immediately. For example, data retention policy implies that there has to be action at some later time. So there has to be bookkeeping to actually remember what are the things that were promised to happen. Okay, uh, we also have here a master policy decision point. Uh, which is essentially a integration component in our architecture that allows several different sources of uh, policy decisions to be integrated. So one of them could be the organization's policies, there could be policies of the user himself, there are probably policies that are um, essentially geared towards what is the trust level of the, of the other party, and then there might be policies that are trust network wide or derived from legislation or European directives. So effectively, this uh, platform allows us to integrate them. We also can support different policy languages at different components by using this architecture. Okay, so here is now kind of the call flow diagram for those who are interested at that level. So let's say the user starts here. User makes an attempt to access a website. User is sent to an identity provider for authentication. Now, if the user is already logged in in the identity provider, he will already have a cookie or you know, a session there, so the user doesn't really see anything, he's immediately redirected back. But it's also possible the user wasn't logged in yet, in which case the user would do something to log in, such as use his uh, strong authentication credential or maybe just username and password. Anyway, then the user comes back here. Now the next thing that this application plans to do is call a web service. In order to call a web service, uh, it has to first discover which web service of the type user wants to use, because there could be multiple ones. And the user essentially, okay, so it discovers it. The discovery has the other important function of providing a digitally signed access token, a SAML assertion, which allows then the web service provider to know the user in a pseudonymous way and understand that this call, in fact, is on behalf of the user, was authorized by user either indirectly or directly. 
Um, also, the policy decision point is called at every, every step of the way, according to that four-point model. Here it's a little bit simplified because the four-point model is quite a lot of arrows back and forth. Anyway, now that we are here, it turns out that this web service provider can turn around and be also a web service client and call somebody else further down in the call chain. And again, to make that possible, it also has to do the discovery step. And this way, the discovery in every step of the way knows what's going on and the user is essentially able to exert control from that point.